As I mentioned, I'll be talking about climate change and in relation to the Anthropocene. What is the Anthropocene? Has anybody ever heard this word before? Uh, you, I'm sure you heard anthropology, uh, or maybe some of you have heard anthropocentric. Well, the meaning of anthropos is a Greek word that means human being. So uh, Anthropocene uh, already points out uh, the centrality of the human being. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Peter Maghetto, in his uh, early remarks today, he had mentioned uh, the legacy, the problematic legacy of uh, this French philosopher that lived about 400 years ago, René Descartes. He was a dualist. And he thought that the world could be divided, as Professor Maghetto mentioned, in two ways. Uh, the mind separated from the body and the body out there somewhere. And uh, this was such an important thought and we still live like that, that we separate human beings here, nature out there. Uh, science deals with nature and arts and humanities deals with human beings. Uh, so you see it's a very dualistic view of the, of the, of the world. And this is so pervasive that our universities are very often organized along those two uh, sides. There is uh, the arts or humanities department over there and the science department is over here. Always separated and there is no much integration. Uh, what's the problem? So what? Well, sometimes climate science, the science that is studying all those issues that we've learned today, uh, is separated from the human being. It forgets the human being. And sometimes those uh, areas studying the human being uh, do not acknowledge or recognize or integrate the scientific developments. So uh, in, when we talk about uh, uh, climate science, sometimes they do talk about the human being and the Anthropocene is a, comp a, comp a concept, I'm sorry, that uh, uh, reminds us of that. But they say, oh, the human being is the problem of all the environmental problems. Well, here's the deal. I think there are types of human beings. There are human beings who cause the problem. There are human beings who suffer the problem. There are human beings who are trying to help. There are human beings who are not trying to help. We learned today of some human beings among us, among the presenters, who have been working in Liberia, in Brazil, in India, trying to help. And at the same time, uh, as Professor uh, Furusa had mentioned, uh, some other you know, human beings that are creating the problems. So when we talk about human being, we're not talking about one person or everybody being equal. They're, we need to define who we're talking about. Now, if we're talking if we're taking this dualistic perspective and separate, and I look at your campus, the campus at African University, uh, if you're coming with the lenses of the scientific view that forgets the human being, you look at the campus and that's what you see, a bunch of acacia trees. But that's not what uh, a famous uh, prophet, actually, Bishop Hartzell, more than 100 years ago, 120 years ago, he saw, it was interesting that he was on the top of the mountain, he looked down the valley and he saw, he was so connected to the humanity that he could see, even though there's only trees, he said, I imagine students walking on this campus. hundred years later, it happened. That's incredible. He could see beyond this, the objects, beyond nature, he could see humans interacting with nature which is what's happening today as we learned from Professor uh, Nisbet. Now let's see uh, what the perspective of natural sciences normally does. Well, it works on hard facts, it's gathering data. Uh, it's telling us a lot of very important facts and figures about uh, uh, climate change. For example, it shows there is a peak in global uh, uh, emissions of uh, uh, CO2, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, it also tells us that uh, the, the peak in emissions coincides with uh, uh, drastic climate changes uh, in uh, 
uh, after 1850 and most especially after 1945. So they say, oh, this climate change has to do with human activities because climate change has happened all over the history. You know, there's a volcano, there's climate change. Uh, the great migration from Tanzania to, uh, to Kenya, the Maasai Mara uh, uh, in Serengeti, they come back and forth millions and millions of animals moving that way, they also affect the environment. But it now it's different. Human beings with so much technology, with so much interference, the impact is massive. And the earth is being changed by that. Now, there are many variables. Uh, for example, uh, besides that, we have to account for the incidence of solar energy, uh, the changes in orbital parameters, uh, acceleration of geological dynamics. I, I mentioned volcanoes, right? Uh, uh, these are some of the elements, but also uh, sudden changes in atmospheric conditions. Professor uh, Nisbet was just uh, experienced a, a, a terrible hurricane uh, last week. Uh, so those things are happening and they affect our lives. But also uh, there are new trends that are being researched, for example, in the United States. Uh, between 1906 and 2006, the, 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 the temperature of the earth uh, rose on average um, 0 0.74 degrees Celsius. Now, compared to this figure, it, it took 100 years for that little to happen. Now, in less than, in about 10 years, between 2006 and 2016, uh, the estimates were that we rose between 1.8 to 4 uh, degrees Celsius in different parts of the world, of course, average uh, being a little above 2 uh, centigrade. Now, uh, then science has, a, has an answer for that. Uh, the same way Professor uh, uh, Jim Griffiths tell you, look, there are solutions, there's ways of remediation, know that. There's a new science that says we can fix it, don't worry. It's called geoengineering. And you can see in this graph, no, oh, uh, the, the too much solar uh, uh, incidence, well, we can build giant reflectors. So the, the light is sent back uh, uh, to other uh, uh, areas. Uh, we can also generate aerosols to, to provide rain. Uh, we can uh, fertilize the sea. Uh, we can you know, get other chemicals to save the ozone and address the issues with ozone layer. We can uh, engineer our crops. Uh, we can uh, have cloud seeding for rain and greening of the deserts. We can pump liquid CO2 into the rocks. We capture and then we trap them in, in different uh, ways. So what's the point? They say, well, no worry, keep doing, keep creating problems. Science can solve it all. I wonder what to think about that. Now, I wanna propose a different perspective you can't just think about the hard science. It's important, of course. But from the perspective of the natural human sciences, uh, you see people. So when I look at the campus of African University, I see not only the trees, but I see your students. I see you. I see your choir. I see teachers. I see professors. I see staff. I see the community participating. People are interacting with your so what is this perspective of the humanities? Well, uh, for example, uh, we learned from Professor uh, Nisbet today that several species have had impact uh, uh, on, on their environment. And uh, studies show a relative small impact of anthropoid use of fire energy. So different tribes at different moments, they use fire and they have an impact, no question about it. But today, with cars, with air conditioning, with uh, uh, all kinds of emissions, uh, especially after the acceleration uh, after World War I and World War II, uh, the impact is tremendous and it is global. Before, the impact would be localized. Now it's global. You do something here in the United States, you, know, you, have, you have a typhoon uh, in the Philippines, uh, uh, or you have even uh, some problems as you experienced last year in uh, or two years ago in Zimbabwe. Now there are changes in perspective as well and people start realizing that, okay, so when humans do something, it changes the environment. 
So we cannot only study the environment, the hard facts. We have to study the environment and how humans relate to the environment. So we need to start thinking about humans as well. So uh, for example, when people are trying to create new words for that, after World War II and the bomb that was uh, uh, thrown in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the at atomic bomb, people start being concerned with what they then called global cooling. I live in the state of Washington and we just had an experience with global cooling uh, two weeks ago. As you probably have heard, uh, some of you, there are massive fires in the west, on the west coast of the United States in California, Oregon, and there was so much smoke that it covered the, the sun, we couldn't see. And the temperature went down some 40 degrees. So that, at that, that time they came to the same conclusion, look, if we have wars and bombs and clouds uh, uh, with those bombs, that's gonna be, bring the temperature down very significantly, we're gonna call it uh, global cooling. Well, then they realized that actually the opposite was happening. Because of CO2 emissions, what was happening was global warming. So and to, to this day, some people get confused. We say, oh, there's global warming. We say, oh no, in my, in, my, in my region, it's getting cooler. It's raining more. But the others say, you know, my is getting hotter and we have droughts. That's why people came with a better term, climate change. Well, be cooler, be hotter, uh, what is happening, it's changing globally. So that's what we call global climate change. But there's still something missing. That concept for me is not quite right. You know why? Because we need to change the discourse again. Remember when I talk about the anthropocentric, anthropos, uh, anthropogenic, and the Anthropocene, we need to include the human in this concept of climate change. That's why I call it global anthropogenic climate change. What does that mean? The climate change that happens not by volcanoes, not by animals moving back and forth, not by the natural movement of the earth, is the climate change that happens because of humans, human actions, human-made changes that affect the environment globally. And that's why it's so important. You see now we're getting, we're bringing the natural sciences, the human uh, perspective, human sciences or humanities. And then we start to see how those two are in interaction. And all those factors, as you can see in this slide. Now, as I told you at the beginning, okay, humans interact with the environment. Great, done, let's go home. Let's finish because it'll be more than two hours. Wait a minute, don't go yet. I told you from the beginning that humans are different. There are plurality of humans. Some humans cause the problem. Some humans suffer the problem. So that, that's why you need to have a plural perspective of humanities, plural perspective of who are the humans. And that's a matter of justice. For example, my problem with natural sciences is when they are studying only the nature without connecting the humanity, without connecting the religious perspective. Depending on your religion, depending on your rituals, you, you may value uh, nature or not. For example, water in many religions is a very sacred thing. It's so sacred that when people are baptized, they're baptized with water. Uh, if you look at art, Art is so important. You know who are the first ones to uh, uh, identify climate change? Painters in the 1750s, 250 years ago. If you look at the paintings in London, uh, all they are painting is what they call at the time black air. They were the first ones to smell it, to see it. And the first documents we have of climate change are the paintings of romantic artists in the 18th century. So art is very important. But also political movements in many countries. Uh, for example, in Germany, they have the famous Green Party that has changed the politics. It became a very powerful party. It implemented lots of politics or policies. And even in the United States today, uh, there's a lot of discussions about what they call the, the, the Green New Deal. Uh, so uh, 
environmental political movements become a very important thing today as well. Uh, so that's another way of integrating the humanities in the discussion. Now, what about the African University? What is happening there? Well, as a pan-African institution, I know that African University embraces uh, the perspectives of different countries, different cultures, and different languages. Therefore, it acknowledges plurality. You come from different backgrounds. I know there's people from Ghana listening to us, people from the United States, people from uh, Burundi, people from Zimbabwe, uh, in many other countries. So we already understand this plurality. People come from different contexts. They are different and they bring different perspectives to whatever we are uh, considering, especially when we're talking about environmental justice. Now, uh, in the 20th century, we start to learn more about this perspective in new disciplines emerged to take care to address those issues. So we have today, not only environmental science, we have environmental history, environmental literature, eco-criticism, environmental economics, environmental law, environmental art, environmental ethics or environmental philosophy. And today, one of the most important things we have, especially in light of this global pandemic of COVID-19 is what we call environmental justice because we want to see who is suffering who is causing the problem, who is suffering the problem. And we need to be just as we address those things. This is your campus and you have those flags right there to always remind us. We have plural perspectives, we're connected to the whole world. And I'm glad to see there both the cross and flame as well as the flag of the United Nations showing that you do have a global perspective uh, in your teaching, learning, now I'm going towards the end here and all I want to suggest the same way Professor Griffith said, okay, you told them all the problem, what's your solution? Well, here's my proposal. We need to have a more, you know, more integration. We need to explore, we need to continue to do science, but exploring links with humanity and with humanities, which are the disciplines that study the human uh, activities, human perspectives or in some cases, what we call human and social sciences. And there are important links between humanity and the environment, which have not been explored yet in their consequences. And so how do we do this? Here's my suggestion. We always need to ask the question, who is the human and what is this human doing? Is causing the problem or suffering from it? And as we talk about human behavior, we need to account for multiple voices in variations according to the culture, to the context. Uh, Professor Nisbet today, he talked about you know, how the farmer there in Liberia, we, uh, uh, that farmer can understand uh, 30 years ago already, something's happening. There's knowledge there. And by talking to, that, to those people, hearing those voices, we learn, we have more sensitivity to what is happening. And the same is true uh, when we include people, as he suggested, from different contexts in Africa, Latin America, Asia, North American global context in discussions about climate change. So in my view, it is possible to integrate more human voices in the scientific discussions about global climate change or more precisely, global anthropogenic climate change. And new studies need to focus more on the, those human interactions as Professor Nisbet, Professor uh, uh, Jim Griffith, Professor Lawrence, uh, Alfred Lawrence, and Professor uh, Zanel Furusa showed us today. We now need to add the cultural, social, religious, and legal structures in the mix if we want to really understand and address the problems that have been described here today. So how would this model look like? Now, if you look at this picture, this image, you see, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, geoengineering come, comes with all kinds of perspectives in uh, trying to you know, show how we, we study the sun, the atmosphere, the so-called cryosphere. Uh, uh, Professor Nisbet was talking about you know, the impact of we're having shellfish in other uh, pictures uh, in the southern part of, of the United States. Uh, the hydrosphere, how our, our rivers and the water systems are being affected. Uh, a biosphere, lithosphere, but very important also, the anthroposphere. You see at the bottom right, how the Anthropocene, the human dimension in that. 
not only in creating new technologies, building new buildings, and, but also in being responsible for now, act uh, and change the, the, and fix the problems. As we do this, and I'm getting to my conclusion here, we need to do justice. We need to do justice by including the humanities. First of all, we have to recognize humans are the main factor in climate change. That's why I don't talk climate change. Climate change could be a volcano, it could be a tsunami. That's a natural climate change. The problem with climate change is when we do it, when humans are the cause. That's why I suggest a more precise term, global, anthropogenic, which means human-made, climate change. And uh, we now have more and more evidence that humans are indeed the culprit. Now, uh, there's why, that's the why they came up with this idea of the Anthropocene. We now li live in this era, in this time where humans are the center. Here's the good news. Humans are the center, not only as a problem, but also as a solution. But in order to really find the best solutions, we need to establish a more direct link, studying not only the sciences, but also the human dimensions and the different human dimensions. Humans are plural, and what happens in North America may have an impact in Africa, and we need to understand what the Liberian farmer is saying, what the people who suffer from uh, the uh, the issues that happened in, in Zimbabwe and Mozambique two years ago are saying what people uh, in the Philippines are saying, different perspectives so we can better understand the, the impact of all these changes. And I quote here uh, something that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, an organ of the United Nations uh, 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 established, and they uh, come to this conclusion, I quote, climate change may be due to natural internal processes or external forces, or to persistent anthropogenic, meaning human, changes in the composition of the atmosphere or in land use. And that's what we learned today, unquote. Now, who is this human that is impacting the environment? Where is the origin of this anthropogenic, anthropogenic I'm sorry, impact? It's not enough to talk about a generic human. Oh, humans cause it because humans have different impacts. Natives in different tribes, they deal with the environment in a different way and we need to learn from them. Urban dwellers, they cause, they generate more trash, they cause more problems than anybody else. People in the suburbs or people living in slum areas, people living in the north, people living in the south, et cetera. We need to qualify better what now, the United Nations and the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, they had proposed an integrative model. And that's the model you see right in front of you. But I, I'm, I'm not happy with that. As you can see, it's talking about a lot of things, but the perspective of plural humanities and their context and the injustice that's happening in different contexts is not clearly integrated in this model. We need to force, we need to go to the United Nations and say, look, I want my voice heard. I want the voice of the different people who are suffering most heard because this is a matter of environmental justice. And I conclude here, to promote environmental justice, we need to acknowledge human plurality. There are different people, their relation to environment, to the environments, which are plural, which are plural, are different, and we need to.